Now, if you've been here regularly on a Sunday night, you'll know that we've been working through the Old Testament and we've been looking at the lives of some of the great men and women of faith. And over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the life of David, the young shepherd boy who killed a giant and then went on to become king of Israel. And then last week, we saw David at his lowest point in life, didn't we? We saw a sexual predator, an adulterer, and a murderer. And amazingly, we saw David repent and be forgiven. And the words of God about David later in his life proved that God forgave him and remembered his sin no more. But you'll remember that Murray talked about the fact that there was consequences for his sin, just like there's consequences for our sin. The child that was conceived in adultery died. But David and Bathsheba went on to have another son, a boy by the name of Solomon. So what happened to this boy? Well, that's what we're going to find out tonight. So turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Kings. We're going to spend a bit of time tonight looking at the life of Solomon. And it's my prayer that his life will teach us something. And I believe it will. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. As the time of King David's death approached, he gave this charge to his son Solomon. I'm going where, everywhere, where everyone on earth must someday go. Take courage and be a man. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all his ways. Keep the decrees, commands, regulations and laws written in the law of Moses so that you will be successful in all you do and wherever you go. If you do this, then the Lord will keep the promise he made to me. He told me, if your descendants live as they should and follow me faithful with all their heart and soul, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. Then David died and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. David had reigned over Israel for 40 years, seven of them in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. Solomon became king and sat on the throne of, his, of David, his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. So after 40 years as king, king of Israel, David died, and his son Solomon is king. So what kind of king was Solomon? And what kind of man was Solomon? Let's find out. Just um, jump over a little bit to 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. That night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and God said, What do you want? Ask and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, You showed faithful love to your servant my father David because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you've continued your faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Now, O Lord my God, you have made me king instead of my father David, but I'm like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your chosen people, a nation so great and numerous that they cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God replied, Before you have, Because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has had or ever will have. And I will give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my decrees 
and my commands as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Now Solomon could have asked for many things, I guess. He could have asked for some of the things that that we asked for tonight. But he asks for wisdom and God gives it to him along with riches and fame. And to this day, Solomon is known as one of the richest men who ever lived. And his wisdom was well known too. The Bible says that rulers came from far and wide to seek his advice. And he wrote part of what we call the wisdom literature in the Bible. The book of Proverbs, which if you read it, is full of wise words. In fact, just after the Lord grants him his request to be wise, we're told of a situation concerning two young women. Now listen to how Solomon solved their problem. It's in chapter 3, starting at verse 16. Now, some time later, two prostitutes came to the king to have an argument settled. Please, my lord, one of them began, this woman and I live in the same house. I gave birth to a baby while she was with me in the house. And three days later, this woman also had a baby. We were alone, but there were only two of us in the house. But her baby died during the night when she rolled over on it. Then she got up in the night and took my son from beside me while I was asleep. She laid her dead child in my arms and took mine to sleep beside her. And in the morning when I tried to nurse my son, he was dead. But when I looked more closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't my son at all. Then the other woman interrupted, It certainly was your son and the living child is mine. No, the first woman said, The living child is mine and the dead one is yours. And so they argued backwards and forwards before the king. So do you get what's happened? They're fighting about this one living child and one is accusing the other of taking her living child and saying it's her own. And they've come to the king for advice. And so the king says, let's get the facts straight. Both of you claim that the living child is yours and each says that the dead one belongs to the other. Is that right? Yes, they say. All right, says the king, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought to the king. Then he said, cut the living child in two and give half to one woman and half to the other. Then the woman who was the real mother of the living child and who loved him very much cried out, Oh no, my lord, stop. Give her the child. Please do not kill him. But the other woman said, All right, he'll be neither yours nor mine. Divide him between us. Then the king said, Do not kill the child, but give him to the woman who wants him to live. For she is his mother. When all Israel heard the king's decision, the people were in awe of the king. For they saw the wisdom God had given him for rendering justice. Wise man, isn't he? And the next chapters of 1 Kings tell the amazing story of Solomon's reign. He became renowned among all the kings of the region. He amassed unbelievable wealth and he built a temple at Jerusalem for God's people to worship in and this was no simple chapel with a a steeple. Chapters 7 and 8 describe this incredible building that Solomon built. The pillars alone were 27 feet tall and 15 feet in, in circumference and cast from pure bronze. And the Bible says God was pleased with Solomon and with the temple. Have a look at 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 1. So Solomon finished building the temple of the Lord as well as the royal palace. He completed everything he'd planned to do. And then the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he had done before at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I've heard your prayer and your petition. 
I have set this temple apart to be holy, this place you have built where my name will be honoured forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. As for you, if you follow me with integrity and godliness, as David your father did, obeying all my commands, decrees and regulations, then I will establish the throne of your dynasty over Israel forever. For I made this promise to your father David, one of your descendants will always sit on the throne of Israel. But if you or your descendants abandon me and disobey the commands and decrees I have given you, and if you serve and worship other gods, then I will uproot Israel from this land that I have given them. I will reject this temple that I have made holy to honour my name. I will make Israel an object of mockery and ridicule among the nations. And although this temple is impressive now, all who pass by will be appalled and will shake their heads in amazement. They will ask, why did the Lord do such terrible things to this land and to this temple? And the answer will be, because his people abandoned the Lord their God who brought their ancestors out of Egypt and they worshipped other gods instead and bowed down to them. That is why the Lord has brought all these disasters on them. So God is pleased with Solomon and he offers him and his people amazing blessing. But with that blessing comes a warning. If you abandon me, God says, and serve other gods, I will remove my blessing and it will be so bad that people will shake their heads in amazement and ask, why did God do such terrible things to his people? So Solomon stands at this crossroads almost in his life. He's been blessed amazingly by God. But with that has come a requirement that he be faithful and that he be obedient. So what does Solomon do? Have a look at chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines and in fact they did turn his heart away from the Lord. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God, as his father David had been. Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. On the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, he even built a pagan shrine for Shemoth, the detestable god of Moab, and another for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Solomon built such shrines for all his foreign wives to use for burning incense and sacrificing to their gods. And the Lord was very angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshipping other gods. But Solomon didn't listen to the Lord's command. And so now the Lord said to him, Since you have not kept my covenant and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. But for the sake of your father David, I will not do this while you are still alive. I will take the kingdom away from your son. And even so... I will not take away the entire kingdom. I will let him be king of one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, my chosen city. So here is a man who is incredibly blessed. He has amazing wealth, great wisdom, huge influence. But he has a weakness. Women. 
And like the temple building, this guy doesn't do anything by halves. He has 1,000 wives. Now, that is not the sin, really. We've talked about this before, the, the fact that in the Old Testament, it seemed that God allowed the practice of marriage to more than one wife. Now, in case you have any ideas, the New Testament is very clear about the fact that men are only supposed to have one wife. Oh? So, whilst having a, a thousand wives is probably a logistical nightmare, that in itself is not the sin. So, what is the problem? Why did God come down on Solomon so drastic for this? Verse 2 explains it. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to other gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. So God had specifically commanded his people not to marry foreign women because they would turn their hearts away from God and to their gods. But Solomon was disobedient and he ended up living to please his wives rather than to please God. And it was his downfall. See, the God that we serve is a jealous God and he won't share his glory with anyone or with anything the Bible is very clear about the fact that we can't serve two masters. Remember Joshua. We talked about Joshua earlier on in the year, the guy that led the Israelites into the promised land. He learnt that and he challenged his people. You can read about it in Joshua chapter 24. He said, if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And, and Jesus said it too a number of times. Matthew 6 is one of them. No one can serve two masters for you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. Or in Matthew 4, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. I found it true in my life as well. You can't serve God and something else. You can't serve God and ambition or God and money or God and success or God on, and your girlfriend, or your boyfriend, or your husband, or your children. Solomon tried it, and it was his downfall. And Murray talked about it last week, that even though our sin is forgiven, we live with the consequences of that sin. See, the blessing and the potential for influence that Solomon had was huge. But as a result of his disobedience and because he refused to put God first, verse 9 says the Lord was very angry with Solomon for his heart had turned away from the Lord. And verse 11, since you have not kept my covenant and you've disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. And that's exactly what happened. After Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam was pronounced king. But the people didn't accept him as king and before long, the nation of Israel was split into two kingdoms, the north and the south. And within a few hundred years, the people were in exile and the beautiful temple that Solomon had built had been destroyed. So much blessing, so much promise, so much wisdom, wealth, influence, so tragically wasted. 
And we can easily do the same thing. God calls us. We're his children. And he blesses us with so much, with abilities, with wealth, with potential. But we push him aside and other stuff just crowds him out. It might be our friends. We might want to serve God, but our friends don't think it's all that cool and they knock us. And so when we're with them, we just push God aside. Or we might really like a girl, but she's not a Christian. And so bit by bit, God gets pushed aside. Or it's our job. And we're working really long hours and it's a great job and the mortgage has got to be paid. But at the end of the day, there's no time or there's no energy for God or for serving him. Or it's sport or music or surfing or TV or COD or Angry Birds or YouTube or Facebook. Be warned, you can't serve two masters. You can't do it. God has chosen you to be his child. He's blessed you. He's loved you enough to die for you. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. He's got good things for you to do. He's got people for you to love and serve. And he longs to be in close relationship with you, to share your life. But push him away and you'll experience his wrath. Let's not water it down. The Bible says that God was very angry with Solomon. And the consequences of his sin affected generations after him. What is coming between you and the relationship that God desires to have with you? What's coming between you and God tonight? Let's pray together. Lord, we are sorry, I'm sorry, for the way that we push you aside, for the way that we allow other things and other people to come between us and you. Lord, would you show us, show each of us here tonight, if there's anything that is coming between us and you, show us what it is, and show us what we need to do so that you are first in our lives. Thank you that we can call you Father. Thank you that we are dearly loved children. And help us to live every moment of every day serving you and walking with you and listening to you and following you. And only you. Amen.